many of you have either farmed or had a garden, worked in a garden? Lots of people? Okay, good. So you know what the experience is like. I was a city girl. I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and, but I still had some great opportunities to experience God's growing. And one of those was in my grandmother's garden. She lived near us, and she had this huge backyard, and in it she had this beautiful grape arbor. And the arbor was someplace where my sister and I could go, and it kind of became our, like our playhouse. And we'd lay under the arbor, and we'd watch the clouds until, of course, the grape vines covered it in the summertime. And then we'd lay under it and eat these purple grapes that tasted so good, fresh off the vine, and we'd get purple grape juice all over ourselves. And, but we loved it so much. And she also had this patch of mint, and we'd pick off the mint leaves, and we'd chew on them and enjoy them so much. And so from a young child, I experienced the, the joy of God's growing things. Another opportunity I had was my aunt and uncle lived in northwestern Indiana, and they were hog farmers. They also had corn and soybeans. But one week every summer, my sister and I would go there and spend the week learning the hard work of a farming family. And my aunt Phyllis worked so hard, but the food that they gathered and they, they canned and they froze was something that was so wonderful and such a great experience for me that it really embedded in me a love for growing things. So I really enjoy that a lot. And so when I read Jesus' passages where he talks about agricultural metaphors or images, it makes me think about those things. But his audience would have been particularly familiar with these already because they had an agrarian economy. And so they would have known what he was talking about when he spoke in these images. The parable that Dick read a few minutes ago is one of two extended speeches that take place in Mark's gospel. And I think that emphasizes how important this parable was in Mark's opinion. He thought that it was important enough to give it extra space. And also, I think at that one point where he t Jesus talks about, if you don't get this, you're not going to get anything else. So this parable is really important. So on this Mother's Day, Aaron and I thought, let's take a look at this parable and see what it says to us and listen. And working out at Peter the last couple of years, growing vegetables and tending the soil with the help of lots of great volunteers, um, I've also connected more with this imagery that God, uh, that Jesus uses throughout the Gospels. You know, I've seen the soil begin to rejuvenate as we've added compost and filled in cover crops that added organic matter to the soil and, and broke up some of that compaction that had happened over years and years uh, of conventional farming. And uh, I've seen an increased number of earthworms as we're digging in the dirt. You can begin to see uh, the life coming back into the soil. Um, and we were beginning to see, uh, though some of you probably don't recognize it if you've been out there and had the weed, uh, there is actually decreasing weed pressure. It's not as much as there used to be uh, in a lot of our areas um, as we've nurtured the soil. Uh, and it's amazing to watch uh, the good seed that God creates um, spring into life. You know, one of my favorite things, and I think one of the it may just be because to get outside in the greenhouse in the wintertime is a fun thing. But when we're first planting all these seeds and these flats, you know, this little seed we stick in there. And then you come back a week later and here's something poking itself out of the ground. You know, this, this little seed is, has emerged and is showing new life and new growth. And it's amazing. Uh, seed always has that potential for growth, but it requires good soil uh, to be healthy and to produce good fruit. Uh, as we were talking about this parable a little bit, um, I just started contemplating, you know, why does God, the sower, go out to sow? You know, what's the purpose of this? And as we talked, we kind of came to the conclusion that the sower uh, goes out to sow with the hope that the seed will find fertile soil. And it will indeed bear fruit. God's desire is for all of us to bear fruit. Uh, God casts out his word broadly, the seed uh, he is uh, looking for, uh, the seed and he is looking for us as his disciples uh, to do three things. And these three things that we are to do 
uh, or in contrast to the three things that Jesus mentions in his explanation of this parable where he talks about thorny soil. Uh, the three negative effects, is, effects Jesus mentions are in verse 19, the cares of the world, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things that keep us from bearing fruit. But they are followed up with a threefold blessing in verse 20. Uh, Jesus explains that if we are good soil, then we hear God's word, we accept it, and then it bears fruit. Pastor Tim Keller says it well. He says, the gospel doesn't do something in you without you. We must not just hear and experience God's word, but we must accept it and let it become part of us uh, so we and those around us can grow and flourish. Uh, that is another thing that I've learned out on the farm is that strong, healthy plants grow faster than the weeds. And so oftentimes they'll shade out the weeds and then they'll die back and the strong plant uh, will be able to prosper. Uh, good soil, uh, you know, sorry, uh, God uh, sows in us, the seed that God sows in us must change us. The good soil turns hearing uh, into doing. But if you find yourself um, today uh, in some not so good soil, do not lose heart because we've all been one of these types of soils at some time in our life. But the soil you fall on doesn't also have to be the soil that you stick with. Uh, you know, seeds blow in the wind. Uh, little birdies come down and pick them up and take them some other places. Others can help transport you to good soil too. And think about this reality too. We get to sow seeds of God's word of truth in our world too. So what's necessary for soil to be fertile and productive? Well, first of all, we have to prepare the soil. And this, this is where as parents, as a mother, I took very seriously my responsibility to prepare the, the soil and provide an environment for my children to experience God's word. And first of all, I had the opportunity to be nurtured in that same kind of environment as a child, so I was blessed in that way. But I was able to involve a children in church from a very young age, Sunday school, Bible school, children's <laughs> choir, uh, children's musicals, all those kinds of things. Uh, we read the Bible at home. We prayed uh, over every meal. We prayed before they went to bed at night. And of course, uh, other special times, but daily developing that habit. And another thing I think I see in Aaron especially, well, actually both of my kids, is that the example that I think I set as a volunteer, as a person who uh, was in service to other people. I pointed out to the earlier service, and some of you probably don't know either, but I didn't go into ministry until my kids were like in junior high. And so all of this was set as a layperson. When I was a layperson and just a mom, a teacher, I was providing these opportunities for our kids to have this kind of background. But the service thing, both of them are currently involved in so many things, like my stole, for example, is from mission trip to Guatemala, brought back to me. Several people asked me about that in the first service. Um, but when we were, when they were little, I remember really distinctly one of the opportunities that I had to take them on a service project. I was in Tri-Cap, and I know there's a lot of Tri-Cappers out here, um, who I was in charge of like the mission project. So we had this Christmas family that we all, that every year we collected for a family, toys and food and all the Christmas things. And so we took him, and I took Aaron and Amber with me, and they were in elementary school. And the circumstances in which these folks were living was very, very depressed, very dire, in our community of Shelbyville, Indiana. And they got to see what other people didn't have and how much they had. And so they had the opportunity to experience that at a really young age and see that everything isn't always so great and that we have the opportunity to share with others and that's a really important thing to do. Also prayer. I think you can never underestimate the power of prayer. My mom had seven grandchildren 
And so for one for each day of the week, and she daily prayed for each one of each day of the week was one of her grandchildren. And um, my kids were day two and three <laughs> in birth order, of course, and of kids. And she had a, kept a diary, a prayer diary, and she always kept track of praying for her children and uh, all the things that were going on in their lives. And even when she wasn't with them, uh, we lived a number of hours away, and she could always have this way of con keeping in contact with them and with our Heavenly Father's will for their lives. And so I've kind of adopted that same process, but I only have three grandchildren, so they get double, double duty. They get prayed for twice a week, and I have my day of rest <laughs> in between. Uh, pray for everything else in the world. Um, so I think prayer is really important, and prayer moves people. It moves people to do things, to uh, behave in certain ways, and it also moves people toward one another and brings people together. And growing up, I was blessed to be uh, supported and encouraged by uh, my parents, and they provided me with a strong spiritual foundation, uh, and they offered my sister and I unconditional love. Um, they also um, took me to church, and it became a, a home for me, too. Uh, the church family was very important, and my parents, I think, realized that no matter how good a parents they were, they couldn't be everything for my sister and I, so that they needed other people who um, cared about the same things that they did uh, to pour into our lives. And uh, so I was blessed with a lot of people like that. And uh, every Sunday I'd go around and the church and I'd say hello to kind of my adopted grandparent type folks. And they always sat in the same place so I could always find them, you know. And um, it was back in the days when there was daily papers in small towns. And so every little thing like lost dogs and honor rolls and, you know, every picture of every little event, you know, somebody was having this or that would be in the paper. And I just remember the feeling of love that I had uh, and being important uh, because some of those people would see those things and they would mention them to me like it, like it was a big deal. You know, being on the AB honor roll isn't that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. Um, but it was a big deal that they recognized uh, something in me and, and wanted to um, show me love and support and encouragement. Uh, parents and other caring adults and members of our church family, um, we help provide a depth uh, to the soil of uh, people's lives. It's amazing to see the fruit that is born when our church family supports the same goals as Christian parents and teachers and pastors and mentors and coaches and friends. What we hear on Sunday morning, though, is not just meant to be a static thing, something uh, that we just take for it what it is and then let it go, but it's rather to be dynamic. It's just like seed. You know, it doesn't look like much when it comes out of the packet or when it's in a jar, uh, but that's not its finished state. God's word is not meant to be in a fixed state either, but ever meaningful, ever uh, speaking into our lives. And this is the beauty of the Holy Spirit who will celebrate uh, the coming of next Sunday on Pentecost. But this Holy Spirit brings new life into God's word and helps us uh, connect to it. Our response to what we hear is just as important as what we hear. What the word of God does in us is just as important as what it says. We, the church, like Christ before us, are now called to be the seed by which the kingdom is scattered over the face of the earth. We are to be picked up and flung by the sower into every area of life, every part of society, every corner of the world. We are to shine forth Christ's light into even the darkest of places. The message of God's love is widely universal, wildly universal. And we as Christ's disciples uh, will be thrown anywhere and everywhere by him with wild abandon. You know, we ourselves are not the light. Christ, the word made flesh, is the light. But we can bear witness to the light through our actions when we stay connected to the source of the power, which is God's word. And when we do that, when we tend the soil and nurture the seed, there will be a magnificent production or harvest far beyond what we could reasonably expect, even 30 and 60 and 100 fold. As 
I said earlier, I was privileged to be planted in good soil in a Christian home. And I just finished uh, reading a, a Lenten study on, uh, on what our mission in life, how we can make a difference in, in our lives. And we're supposed to stop every week and think about someone who made a difference in our lives. And, and of course, my mom came to my mind right off. And I stopped to think about how I would be if I hadn't been raised the way I was, who I might be. And I can't even imagine how, who I would have been or how it would have transpired. So as a mother, as a grandmother now, as a teacher, as a pastor and friend, I've grasped the great value in the seeds of God's word, how we scatter them and share them with other people. And with God's help, I've always sought to plant um, those seeds in, in fertile soil so that growth and fruit might exceed our greatest expectations, and they have. They have. So God can do far more in us and through us than we can ever, ever imagine. And it comes from tending continuously um, our relationship, the environment in which we are, and thinking about those things always. I want to end our time together this morning by sharing with you words from a Pauline prayer in the book of Ephesians. Paul wrote to the church family that he loved so much in Ephesus, and they were his family. He did, his, his churches were his family. And he had these words of comfort and appreciation and inspiration that I think is a marvelous ending for our time together. So let this be my prayer to all of you. Let us pray. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with the power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus.